you want to do that? Let me get that. Yeah, and it's just in the mind. We got to get the second person in there too. That work? Okay. We will begin in a few minutes. All right.
Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, I'll still a few people coming, I suppose. Shall I start though? Go ahead. Um, in everybody's life, sudden things happen. New discoveries. Um, I was always puzzled. I was always puzzled how people in a wheelchair and um, unable to move were still able to get a picture about the mental picture about movements. We were thinking when you cannot walk yourself, it's hard to understand what walking is. Yes, there are the things, oh yes, you do it with your eyes, you, you follow it, but if they have these people in the scanner, and they show them people walking or people even skiing, they noticed that in that brain of people who never had been able to walk or to ski, the same areas in the brain were triggered. That's strange. And then these findings were supported by Italian researchers. And he had, they put electrodes on the scalp of a monkey. And one monkey was observing the other one breaking a branch or breaking a peanut. And then it appears that the one who was watching this in the same frontal area of the brain, F5, the same neurons were triggered. For heaven's sake. So you can learn, you can learn things and your brain develops accordingly by just observing them. So you don't need always to copy the action. You can do just by watching and observing it. Okay. That in my theory, theoretical development was a big eye-opener. The discovery in 1992 of the so-called mirror neurons in the brain, the MNS system. So it appears that in mirroring people, action, Brain circuits are triggered and stimulated. And even more important is that you can do that unconsciously. And I brought it with me, but I did not know because I applied that for Andrew, that's why I'm talking about it. I start my lectures on mirror neurons with one of our folk singers, and he's in the stadium and he sings a popular song, and all the audience 
whether they want it or not, they move. When one person moves next to him, it's just contagious. Right? I Even a policeman regulating the traffic gets better to the community. He can stand. No. That's what we do. We don't know that all of a sudden we are. living organisms that unconsciously we mirror each other's face, emotions, movements. And when somebody says, and now you hear me talking, and I am so happy today, and happy today. Nobody starts crying. And you feel, you feel happy. You feel happy. And the contrary is true when somebody has a sad face and a deep voice. You go down in your emotions. And that's what I was playing this morning. I played with this young man's emotions. And I can, and you can, I can make everybody happy. And I can make everybody cry. That's the fascinating system. So. And it can happen like the yawning, the giggling in church. It can happen at the subconscious level. I call that in the old days, and they use in this theory, they use this term, it's called resonance. There is in a human behavior, let's stick to you, a phenomenon resonance that your brain of two people adjust to each other. Even at the, at the length of the brain wave, it is literally what we speak of. We are on the same wavelength. It is so. We are on the same wavelength. And a lot of things happen in an unconscious way. Really resonating when somebody, when the, mar when the band marches and stands like this, you know, moves without knowing you are moving yourself. Very for the children we are working with very important findings. I try to develop as a new perspective 
in our work, the theory of mirror neurons further. I give you examples. For instance, I will show you how I did with Andrew knowing about this theory. For him, following actions or doing actions is hard motorically. No need for that. I asked yesterday, and hopefully we can put up the clip in a minute. You saw him this morning with the cup. So I asked for a second drinking cup. And I was mirroring all his actions. When he put it to his mouth, I put it to his mouth. When he put it there like this, I put it like this. And at certain stage, I put it like this, and he tried to compare. By doing this, you trigger the same motor neurons in his brain than he's actually imitating you. So people who have a severe motor problem can learn actions, putting up a cap on the bottle, even without that he can do it, still the brain forms circuits how to put the cap on the bottle. Okay. So you have to follow as I hopefully did demonstrate, very carefully the actions of the child, of the person. And you mirror these actions so that you are doing things almost at the same time together. It can be mouth movement. And yesterday you asked, what age do children resonate? 21 days, four weeks. When you, what I know, open the mouth, move your tongue for a three week old child, he resonates and does it. So that resonance, you understand, is the basis of human communication. The mirror neurons are on the basis of motor development, of development of speech, and development of, of language. So there's a whole area of possibilities, so many, that you do things with children exactly together. One of my examples is that a child from Kenya, we just enrolled, is just doing things for herself, not being interested. When she drinks, that's what she does, I've asked the teacher immediately to drink with her. Goes back. Then the teacher gets the pitcher with the lemonade. She's, she's following it, she's following, she's following that the, the bottle is poured. Then they both drink again. Remember in the old days, this, following the rhythm of the child. I always started getting into contact by taking over their movements. Now, 
I know why this was a successful approach. Because I stimulated the growth of that system which helps us to imitate and to follow other people. Now, it's an enormous story and since I'm developing this, um, I get a lot of invitations, particularly from the field of the neurosciences. Said, yes, we know because there was a long debate whether mirror neurons exist. Well, I tell you, they can even count the number of mirror neurons which are firing. So there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. They exist for touch, they exist for motor, and they exist for hearing. And for hearing is very interesting. I'll tell you one thing. Deaf people in Belgium, deaf children, with a bubble. The children were young adults in the scanner and they were hearing comparing the group and they saw the action and they heard the sound. Okay? And then there were the deaf kiddies seeing the action, and not the sound. And the number of mirror neurons triggered when you see and hear at the same time is significantly different. Hundreds and hundreds mirror neurons more are firing, meaning more activation of the brain when you hear and see at the same time. And when I was telling that to a group of people where there were deaf people, they said, yes, yes, I know that because my mother wants always before she opened up things, she, she wanted to always and asking when you tear a paper, B -b -b how does it sound? How does it sound? So in teaching, for instance, home economics to deaf people, and of course to deaf blind people, it's not only showing them how to saw, but also Letting them hear. It explains the early delay for some months of children in their motor development. Because we always knew that they did not hear their footsteps. But why was that so important? Because movements and sounds are together. And Yesterday we discussed Andrew and said, with help he can, he can move. And you have seen how important <coughs> hearing is to him. Put little bells around his feet. That was the reason, because movements and sounds trigger extra, not extra, very significantly more mirror neurons in the frontal area, in the motor area of the brain, than just seeing them. So, with that picture, I would just go high, so blah, 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 blah. the water will be audible to come down. This brings us to a whole idea of bringing the children to resonance and from there to imitation. And as I mentioned this morning, imitation is, the ones who have studied Piaget know that, that imitation is 
are the basis of learning. How much do we learn by imitation? Ba, ba, ba. All your text phones, you say, how, show me, how do you do that? And you show, oh, show me, show me how to drive a car, how to cut with scissors, etc. So I said to the teacher of home economics, cut together with the child, cut together. Don't show him and say, you have to cut like this. No, that doesn't work. Cut, do things exactly together. <coughs> when you are tearing things, have both a piece of paper, you go, stop, stop, and stop. Even have the microphone, so there is an extra sound element. This would add tremendously <coughs> on the effect of your intervention. Niels, can we show the second <coughs> clip of Andrew? And then I move over to Iris. See, there I try to do with them. See, I have now the cup in my mouth. See, compare it. See, and exactly his. Oh, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. He's following that. Yeah, now I'm at the ball. See, having my cup and his in the same position. Holding that and showing, not that they wanted him to put the lid on it, <coughs> but just having a perception of it. He pays attention. So I mirror his. He compares, looks back. I hope, yeah. She's going to follow me. See, he looked back and forth. Fascinated. Mm -hmm. 
Show, show, show. could see God's attention compares to one cup with another and that's fine I would not ask to put the lid on it but that's the beginning in the meantime he gets very uh, deep stimulation of his motor neuron system so I think it opens perspectives for a lot of, let's say, children who are motorically very involved in doing things. Is there mirror neurons of touch? Yes. But that, that's again uh, an, 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 an another story. And that's why I was really happy that we could touch each other and hold ourselves. That mirror neuron system is a different part of the brain, not studied so well. Uh, in in other areas than than hearing, but also in vision and also relating to to deaf children and so forth. So I think that through showing imitation, doing the same thing, pouring things together, and later on we had he was very interesting. It we had the bottle and we put a marble in it or a bead. And, it beat, and you could see that that triggered the seeing his bottle and then hearing the sounds of the beat following it. That triggered an extra dimension of attention. So I think the whole discovery of that system, uh, which is still a lot in the laboratory with animals and so forth, uh, might help us to find new, new pathways, new ways to develop in these in these children and you know i'm working on it as i said in in the classroom in particular also with children with intellectual disability and autism it has been shown that in these kids the mirror neuron system is very 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 weak so with mutual laughing and smiling and everything i did we we hope that we can make this person more sociable but you have to try, and perhaps it is all a hype, and forget about it. But I don't think so. There is so much research coming out of animal laboratories and with people that, uh, that I think we cannot deny the existence of this system anymore. And it asks our creativity to continue on that. Okay, so I leave then uh, it with... Uh, with Andrew, unless you have any questions, then I go, as I put on your program, a rather formal assessment, because he came in and it's good that we follow also the program. And I would like to show you Iris. This child high functioning with charge. Okay? And then we go over Okay, may I have the next slide? Ah, uh, Iris, in that time, Iris was about four years of age. Let's take the next one. No. Yeah, next one. And uh, this is the general guideline. This is becoming a more formal presentation. As I did this morning, always the same talk to the parents or the principal caregivers about the interest and preferences. Right. 
observe the child while talking to the parents. We saw that you have had a close connection with the mother this morning. Yep. Process is guided by the child's interest. I mentioned that before. And starts with following the child's interest and adapt according to accordingly. Okay? You go a little bit fast. As we mentioned, an environment that is comfortable for the child. In this case, on a rainy Monday morning, we went to the farm of the, of the parents in the middle of the country. And as I mentioned, I like to guide the parents through that whole process. Because they are the most familiar with the child. And secondly, when you guide them, as you will see that, to ways they never have explored with the child, like in this case, playing with the child, they never played with the child, you have not to tell them, you say, you have experience playing with, remember? Da, 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 da. So that helps quite a bit to help the parents to apply your suggestion, okay? Now. Here's mother and child. Can you make the clip go in, Nils? Short clip, but I have a question. Yeah. No? I like the first one. Yeah. Sitting on the lap. No? Oh. No. It's not what I see. Huh? Go back to the opening first. Well, that's okay. No. No. All right. So that's the teacher, but I like to go back, but take the first slide again. Sorry. Uh, that's enough. That's enough. If you can enlarge this. Now, here we go. A question. 40% of charge kids are. Hello, man. 40% <laughs> of the kids of charge have autistic tendency or belong to the spectrum. Now, do you think that Iris is all autistic? Where is that? I want to show you a picture. You can see that. Yes. Is she? No. no. Oh, look at that gaze. Look at that gaze. We've done uh, for this quite a bit of differentiating autism from their blindness. And if they have vision, two sections of this, of this has to show that. I come back and I is one of the main things we differentiate the blind kids. Here's one I is blind and one of the 25, 30 percent. So right from the moment we can see that uh, that probably but she has no uh, she does not belong to the spectrum. Okay, so yes, then we go on. Now the domains to, to be assessed. Relationship, I go quick. Interaction and communication. Preferred sensory learning channels. Anticipation of events. The neurobiological state, is the child quiet, drowsy, agitated, okay. The next one. Problem solving, motor skills, orienting behaviors towards new events, imitation, and understanding a routine. In the book, they are a little bit comprised to eight domains. But if you look through, and I did, let's say, a couple of thousand or more assessments, and I always ask when I follow the domains at random order, did I cover every, any, everything? 
most of the time people say yes. I would add now odor. Odor is still a very important thing in my development, but, uh, but this book is now five years old. Okay? Now, now let's see. I demonstrate now how to assess relationship. The teacher has just arrived. She makes herself know, you know, my object of personal reference by playing with her necklace, which is a teacher's special object of reference. Yeah, still, I agree with my old thing, but still working. Notice the affectionate bond between the two, okay? Let's say we always do every day a greeting ceremony. <laughs> they do it. Together, she's putting it back. There's more sound on it. There's no more sound on it. Sound. Okay? So, talking about relationship, that's really affectionate relationship. I tell you, we have gone now 30 seconds. And I know already a lot. I know the child is not autistic. I'll show that the child can build up a fine relationship. I know that the child understands the ritual of greeting. Oh my gosh, I could write an IP on that already. Okay, let's continue. Again, as you have seen also with Andrew, the meeting of each other's eyes. You know, is she willing to look into the eyes and smile? Let's see that clip. <laughs> see, here we go. Smiling together. All right, let's continue. Okay. In the next clip, you can observe uh, domain three. How is with that one eye and uh, some vision left in the other way, how does she perform visually? You will see too that she looked for the mother for approval. So watching the face of another person. And last but not least, when she has that board to, that puzzle board to put in uh, pieces in the, in the spare openings, she cannot get it very well. And now the moment comes, can she, what's often the problem in charge, can she control herself? Will she bangs on it, throw that board away, asking for help, or will she persevere? So in one little clip, you can make so many observations, okay? That's the mother. She looks for approval and the mother said, no, I'm not going to help you. You try it yourself. No, I'm not going to do that. Hey. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. 
she tried to push it in. But she re she's getting better. And you know, you see success is success. Move a little bit. You turn it. Right. Yeah. Bangs on it. Yeah. And now you take it to the corner where the toys are kept. And you see the balance problems of children with charge. All right. Um, so we looked visually, may I have this back? Visual task, she's, she is interested in the visual task. Looks to her face for approval, do I do a good job? And last but not least, in children with charge, with so many behavioral problems, when there was a I have to move a little bit forward so I can see the people there. Thank you. I'd like to always to see the audience. Okay. Thank you. Um, very important observation. Because I see many charge people with severe behavioral problems, because they cannot control themselves. Burn. Stretch. Attack. A lot. One of my best articles I wrote on that in the journal of, of uh, medical genetics about what part of the brain is involved when people cannot control themselves. And here you see already that you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about Iris. I can make that prediction just by seeing when she's frustrated, she could do a lot of things bad, but now asking for help, the mother gives her help, and she's happy. See, in these little things, when you know what to look for, the assessment support. And you can say, go on with your child. Don't be afraid that your iris is autistic. Don't be afraid that she's so damaged that she cannot control her emotions anymore. Okay? And then you see that she's willing with a little bit of help to solve that she takes over. The, the parents uh, suggesting turn that a little bit and then she solved it. So with a little bit of help, she can solve that simple, not for her, but for a jigsaw puzzle. And um, the result so the mother say, you're finished now. And then she, she picks up the board and walks into the corner of the room. So she knows after finished, we put that in the corner. So she knows that event already, uh, which means that her brain changes, changes events together in a routine, which are very important. Okay, and we move on. Okay, let's have the next slide. So uh, when she's doing that, that board by putting in, and that's a big problem with people with charge, because of the balance problems, they are a long time flat on their back, right? And they cannot play very well with their hands in order to establish eye-hand coordination, right? The only thing they see is a piece of the ceiling if you lay flat, particularly when you have big columbomas. But you see here that the neurological development of this young child 
is pretty well promising. See, because when she looks, and also she was on her, on her flat on her back for a long time because charge kid because of the balance problem walk late in life despite that she has managed to establish the relationship between the hands and the motor and the visual area of the brain go for it i said my gosh we might have here how far are we doing now 15 minutes we might have a promising child no doubt about it see what she already accomplished together with the mother and the teacher quite a bit and i'm always thinking on the ip i'm going to write for this child see, i know now she must be challenged to solve puzzles that we boost her intelligence that um, that um, we do fine motor skills, we do try to draw, and a little bit of writing. It's all within her possibilities. See, when I do, and I hope you will do that, when I do these assessments, and in this time, and you see, I'm watching it, I'm always thinking, what does this mean for the next step to IP? Because IP should be, be built on the strength of the children. So if I would stop to take now what I sometimes do, and ask you to write down, as far as we are now, which strength should be included in the IP, I think you, with your experience, you come up with a lot of things. You say, we will have interactive play together. Perhaps he even can go to kindergarten with the typical peers. Uh, we could, she lives on a farm. She can join the father with, uh, with milking the cows. And then the, the, the motor of the machine doesn't work because he has unplugged it can she find the plug and put it in all the things just come up into my mind see how strong this type of assessment is particularly when it is done by the mother and as you can see she can do it okay can we have the next one well every anybody who knows my theory knows that i have felt that looking forward, anticipation is a very strong thing. I know now why it is so strong, why anticipation. So thinking about the next event is so important. Because through anticipation, you help to grow the connection parts of the brain. In the brain, millions of little knots are there. The synapses and the thickness of the synapses determine your intelligence. Because the, th the more thick they are, the more connections and the more solutions you have. And intelligence is being able to solve a problem to find solutions. So the, ch -ch 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 -ch. the more connections, the better it is. How are these connections formed? By thinking on the next event and seeing that what you are thinking is right. I think that I have my Car key. Now it's my what here. My car. Oh yes, yeah. it fits. I'm thinking ahead that I'm going to drive car. I have two keys to choose from. I selected the right one. Psst. This key with the black key holder is the one you need for driving your car. 
that's come from my Russian experience. As I mentioned, I've been working 20 years in Russia. My gosh, they know about brain. So this anticipation, and you will see a very nice example of it. If you just put the slide up, but not play it yet, so I can explain. All right. See, in a moment, you will see the table, and there's a box with openings. And you can open the box with a key, and you can open the red box by red key, and the blue, the door, sorry, the blue door, with the, yeah, I think you have that key. And you see here that she is, there are four keys on the key ring, that she is already selecting one, anticipating I'm going to open, I think, the red door. Then you steal my heart. Let's see. That's it going. Yep. Look again. Checking. Voila. If you see that, looking, checking, am I right? It's 100% Piaget. But it's 100% Andrew. Remember that when we did? He looked at the two bottles, checking back and forth. Intelligence is thinking ahead and checking by going back whether your solution is okay. That's intelligence. So a child who thinks ahead, I'm going to open the red door. Do I have the red key? The right key? Yes. No, I don't. I think, I think, I'm happy for the people who are watching this stream to receive emails not agreeing, but I have the feeling and I have some proof that I can improve intelligence significantly by this approach. Problem solving, by anticipation, by applying mirror neurons. That would be something, is that? And that is, you know, I, I told you, when I come back and see all these rubella youngsters sitting, you know, not all, some of them are doing fine, but the ones who have really a big side problem, they sit at the, you know, a severe intellectual disabled. And again, I think, if I had them again in my hand with the team I worked with all those years, they would be intellectually high functioning. You can, you can bombard the brain and to form and let the synapses grow. It's enough animal studies on that. So that is, sometimes I made to the parents prompts that how do you estimate, and oh, it's quite intellectual delay, but we can do something about it. Our Jewish friend Farstein did a lot with that, with the children in the Arab deserts who didn't have, were very deprived. Most, more of these children have no overt brain damage. They are deprived. Children like Charles laying flat on the back with huge columboma. What do you think what's happening in brain? Nothing. So you must guide that very carefully with a lot of insight in the human brain. That's what I feel, that we leave out a lot of potential in, in children. <clears throat> okay. Arnest put the block in the apartment, in the department. And now something comes, and which I do not see a lot. That is symbolic play. 
That is symbolic play. Every IP which lacks play, the people who wrote that should look in the mirror. Am I doing well? <coughs> because you get to see a thing which you hardly see spontaneously. Yeah? She puts a block in the door, in the compartment, closes the door, and then, as it were, as it were, she is going to leave her mother, the block, she waves goodbye to the block. And then I said, I freeze on my chair. I freeze on my chair. Is that not something? I can sway him to the block. No, she, she can already, without any help, no. I think by observing her older sister, she pretends that that block is a person. Okay, let's see that. I never forget it. Look at this now. Yeah. <laughs> you have to <laughs> And she smiled as it were saying, I know that this is funny, <laughs> waving to a block, but I know what I'm talking about. <coughs> if you get to see that in your assessment. Oh boy, and you show that to the parents and show it to the teachers. Okay, see, play, play with them. Pretend to have, you will see that. Because then that's assessment. I asked the mother, do you play? No, I have no time for that. I don't know how to play. So then we get the doll out. And we have the cup out and feed it, you will see that. So. I immediately think on the IP. I must help this parent to play with Iris. This is not enough. I cannot say do symbolic play. It's like saying uh, follow I theory on gravity. Show. Show, show, show. Let them copy. Mirror neurons. Okay. Yeah, um, social behavior. In Holland, we need coffee, always coffee. And so we have a break in the kitchen. And of course, we have cookies. Let's show that. There's a little, a little brother, and he's had taken a nap. Here. Here. Yeah, she, little devil. See, spontaneously, she gives the child a cookie. Top social behavior. <coughs> now, the sad part of my success story. Cochlear implant. She had cochlea. And of course, I'm sorry to say that, she goes to a nearby hospital with an audiological center. But so far, no response. Said, I have a sonorous voice. We have a nice social situation. Underline nice social situation. Let's see how she responds to my voice. Okay. It's first time. Huh? The word cookie in Dutch is cookie. Thank yeah. you. Okay. 
No. She's okay. The mother says your little brother is going to sleep. Laura. Laura is going to sleep. Yeah. And now, now what you see. Now, you are smart people here. We had a long debate about this. What does the kiss mean? Who knows who has it? Excuse me? Who could not? Could not? Yeah. What is she telling the mom? What is she telling the mom? Now we go to the cochlear implant uh, and the cookie. Okay? Can we have to film on that? Laura is back from sleep. I'll have a cookie. A cookie. Yeah. A cookie. Yeah. Ah. So, just repeating, please give me a cookie, please give me a cookie. And with the balance problems of charges, she turned her in my direction. Even with this response, I lost a little bit sight of her the last few years. I don't think that the cochleas did work very well, but that's another story. But here you see that in the social situation of giving a cookie and not sitting dry, raise your hand when you hear something, you know, as some people do, but just social situation in which cookie already played an important role, you trigger that little bit of here and what's left. Aha. Uh -huh. And then you can see in the next that she tries to imitate my mouth movements. Okay. See how she looked from a distance, seeking that corner of the eye which is still functioning. mama. A mama. A cookie for mama. A mama. Complete in the rhythm of my voice. Oh boy. Okay. Let's have the next one. Well, you've seen, I told myself if I can leave a message here, is play. Play, play. So I, there's two other girls there, the little Laura, the baby, and the six-year-old ones. I said to mom, I'm sure you have dolls. So I already played dolls combing for feeding them, etc. Okay. Believe <coughs> Yeah. Okay. 
at the dog. You can eat, the dog can eat, and you can eat. Aha, she's feeding with the spoon. Okay. Well, I'll give her a little bit of food. Mother shows. Aha. Lekker. Lekker means taste good. Okay? Now. What is more? How this child has perceived the world. She got hold of a camera and she makes a picture, so-called picture, of everyone except me. Yeah, sheep. No. Yeah, I can say. Okay. So she understands the social routines and so forth. Okay, I think we come now to an end. The ten domains <laughs> or eight. Uh, constitutes essential aspects of learning and behavior on which the IP can be built. We have designed such a plan for IRIS and we would like to show part of it. That is an assessment of a child, of course, with considerable mental development to delay, where you can cover pretty well all the areas, all the domains of that problem of the assessment of the um, Okay. Okay. You are the No, not 
A mother, a family, a family who cannot sign. They have hundreds of cows. How would you solve that problem? Don't talk about the sign language courses. They have no time. Huh? You know, have to milk the cows and make a living. How could we make this family signing? Who are the best signers? Come on. Deaf adults. Teacher, deaf they are church going people, and in that in that community it is a deaf couple. Here you go. Come on the weekends, go to church, have cake after church, and you know, milk the cows, and that's the way. <coughs> so Go to the sign language course, and everybody drops out, including myself. <laughs> it's so dry. Ask your deaf friends to come over. Both you know, learn to know the deaf people, make friends, and say, when I cannot make the signs for wine properly, <laughs> you open the bottle. <laughs> Yeah, so many good people are willing to, because you all know that after a thousand signs, we drop out. We drop out, but that's a different story. So, let's go. Will you put up the IP of virus? No. So the first thing, but you have your handouts, that's easy, isn't it? Now, can we have the first slide? Now, this is the summary, okay? Moderate visual impairment, with bilateral columbomas, severe neural sensory hearing impairment, okay? Take the next one. Social relationships. Interaction of communication, preferred sensory channel, anticipation. Next one, please. Now, true or false? In this way, the book works. Aries enjoy the attention of other people. Clear affection, security, eye contact, Social behavior poorly developed. Of course, one, two, three, and four are correct. Okay, let's see the answer. Clear affection, security, and gives good eye contact. I'll put it in this way to be the bricks of the IP when we discuss social behavior. Okay, can we have the next one? By learning sign language, 
the whole family can involve in our social sub development, which is definitely a strong side. May I have back? May I have seven back? May I have the slide back? She has appropriate behavior because the mother is sensitive to our needs. Remember that form said, no, you can do it with a little bit of help. She, she did not help too much. And she did not frustrate Iris by uh, failing her. No, she had, okay. So the mother is okay. And teach Iris sisters to play with her. They have an ideal family. A six-year-old one who's going to elementary school and a little one who will grow up in a year, year and a half from, from this moment. She will in kinder and do in symbolic play. So that play is in the heart of my thoughts on her. Okay, next one. Um, interaction and communication. What's interaction? Interaction is that there is a mutual influence. Iris laughs and mother responds. Mother asks something and Iris responds. There is a mutual thing going on between the two. And Iris knows, the mother know, Iris mother knows what the daughter wants from her. Think on the helping thing. But also Iris knows what mother wants from her. Yeah? They follow each other's thoughts. Although with the kiss, mother failed to follow Iris' thoughts. But in other ways, with the feeding of the doll, the mother said, you feed it, and Iris responded to that. And she understands that signs carries meaning. Uh, I left, I cut a little bit of this, but I was, I was also trying to teach her a few real signs. Okay, let's have it. They influence each other's behaviors in different ways. The mother knows, she's aware, they follow each other's thoughts, and they understand the signs. Okay, we have the next one, please. Yeah, that's obvious, isn't it? Encourage to teach this girl as soon as you can. Yesterday is better than today, the sign language of the Netherlands. And it's a good idea to introduce deaf people in this process. Next one, please. Um, yeah, that's an issue for hearing parents to have really using uh, sign language uh, with its own grammar. Uh, I would not recommend that for these parents, but just using sign Dutch as you have signed English. Last but not least, make memory books. The calendar, here's Van Dijk talking, and tell stories in sign language to first stimulate this communication. The Parents Foundation have made several storybooks in sign language. So that would be with the other kids sitting on the floor or, you know, at the kitchen table and telling, you know, the sign language, of course. And, um, in that time when I wrote it, continue cochlear implant. Preferred sensory learning channels. Exploring object by touching. Listening to speech. Mm. Prefer to explore things visually with tactual support. Looks at the picture, I watch people draw. And again, that place was not very well lighted. So I added something 
that she can see better, okay? What do we include? She explores visually, she likes watching people, and when I put new lamp bulbs in it, you know, I just get up the ladder and, and I do these things, everybody could see that the room was much more suited for this little girl, okay? Now, the concepts, give her pictures, let her inspect things visually, show recorded fairy tales, and give her opportunities to draw and to paint, okay? She's clear about the event, she thinks ahead, she does not act impulsively, and is determined by things she happens to see, okay? She understands events, she thinks ahead, and she's tuned up when she carries out activities, she's really alert, okay? Play games, problem solving, say today it is raining, what clothes shall we put on? Calendar system, letting her set the table together with her sister, think ahead that father needs a big cup, a mother of course a small cup, all right. All right, so in this way I would, based on an assessment, draw up an IP in false and good statements which clarify the ideas. In the book are many examples of, uh, as a matter of fact, four of how to write an IP for these children. What do you think? What do you think? I rushed a little bit, but you know. What do you think? Is this a workable thing for you? Yeah. You said yes. It would work for you. And you are very, yesterday or so, you are a positive lady, I like that. <laughs> Would that work for you, sir? <clears throat> I'm David Finn from Stanford University in Birmingham. You know, as you talk about Iris, who is a three-year-old, I think about children who are older, who don't have an IFSP. That means? An Individualized Family Service Plan, where we write goals for the family. All right. And our, uh, our federal law idea is 11 years out of date. And so now it's time for a comment period. And I was just sitting here thinking, I wonder if a, a valid comment would be for us to consider goals like this, you know, for a family. I mean, I think it's far more helpful, you know, to come up with resources for a family as say as your son gets older because I'm so tired of listening to goals that, that have to do with math and reading and science and social studies. And if we're lucky if there's a social goal in there, but the, the goals for families seem to stop at three. And it, from what you're saying, you've got a nice framework, you know, for, for looking at what the next goal would be for a family. It's just a comment, but I just, I've never thought about that before. So this was a great workshop for, that, for John Winston alone. Thank you. Who wants to follow up with this comment? Oh, yeah. It's, it's a really, it's a really 
really, really brief comment, but it makes it even worse when you're having to deal with a triple A and a child with a progressive disorder, which means to me, I really don't give a flip about him adding and subtracting, but yet him interacting with other people. So I agree with you. Other comments? Don't make me stand up here by myself. Um, I'm always good in that. I put people on the spot. I've been the whole day on the spot. What would you say? Well, personally, I love it, but that's when you work in the school system, you are bound by all these measurable, obtainable goals. How many out of how many times? Plus, they have to yes. read on grade level. level. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. I'll so, give you an answer. I'll give you an answer because that's exactly why I came to this country. I think nobody disagrees unless you stand up and leave home. That this is an individualized, individualized plan. Tapping on the strength of the little girl, potential of the family, etc. Okay, what would I do when I was in your country? And I was a teacher, and I know about his objectives. I think in everything you saw about social behavior, about problem solving, of play, interaction, I can break it down in measurable elements. You challenged me. Okay, how would I then then social behavior? Social behavior. My goal would be, my goal would be play with mother and sister and little sister and count, not every day, count the initiatives of Iris. Yeah, how often she initiate a new activity in the game? So the goal could be social play with increasing stimulation for Iris to take initiative. The baseline is in 20 minutes play. Eight initiative, the goal is 15. Okay, give me a problem solving. Uh, doing math. Aris selects five blocks in one minute time, putting that in the box. Our purpose is that she selects eight blocks in three minutes. So, give her time to look at things, but repeat it every day a little bit, so she becomes very proficient in finding the holes. Goal accomplished. You, I know a little bit how your IP works. You can, and that's what I'm trying to do with my friends in New Jersey next week, I try to work with you people that this child-guided approach could be the basis of your IEP within the framework of what you are told to do. And I know you have to do math and social studies and awareness and even, and even citizenship. I know. Sorry. 
I don't laugh, so you shouldn't laugh. <laughs> See? I, yeah, I understand exactly in which situation you are. But I think you can. I think you can. I think you can. And perhaps it's not playing lip service, but I can even see it would be an improvement. It would be an improvement that you think still make things countable. Like the signing. She has no signs. So that would be, we teach her signs for play. She lives on a farm for cows and milking, etc., etc. We have picture books for that, etc. And our goal is that at the end of the summer, she will have 50 signs. I cannot see, and you've been with me all day, I cannot see how this works against what you have to do. Does it? No, it doesn't. But we had a very similar situation about not IP, but about eligibility. About what? Establishing eligibility. Yeah. I think that's where, the big, that's where our biggest problem was, where we have to fit them in the category, we have to establish an eligibility category, and we have to meet certain criteria, and that's where our biggest Hang up. No, I, I don't know. Hang up. Well, that's where difficulties. <laughs> but okay, give me that. <laughs> Put me on the spot as much as you can. And we can describe the chat. We have a student. We can describe what she's like. We know what she, her strengths are. We know who she is. Yet we have to find an eligibility criteria with a number. I'm sorry. Fine. Fine. Well, Fine. Uh, you know there are different. No, give me, give me, give me an Not example people. what you cannot do. What I cannot do? What you cannot do with your child, you would like to do. But now you have the straight jacket. I would like to say this is who this child is, and therefore this is how she learns, and this is what we need to do with her. Rather than, Rather than we have to put the label, put her in a, in a drawer, say, okay, she has, but we have to have an IQ, we have to have a number, because if we don't have this label, we cannot give her the correct services. Sometimes they uh, maybe no, you're right. Sometimes they don't fall into that. We need the microphone, it's so much more real. I feel like, uh, God, now I forgot. Um, <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's not so cookie cutter to, to meet our eligibility criteria, not necessarily, you know, for VI, deaf blindness, any other disability category. And it's not so cut and dry, and you wonder about the quality of services and what they are receiving after eligibility and whether or not you're even a part of that team, well, I feel like. Some of the forms we have to use, the forms that, the, the, not checklists, no, I mean the forms actually that a State Department requires or whatever, I may use the wrong words right now, force us to use ter certain assessments, certain terminologies that we don't agree with necessarily, but um, to, make a child eligible to receive services whereas we could put i would just love to have an observation you do and saying this is how she is this, this should is be used for every kid absolutely and this is how right just student who's just, deaf blind and focus yeah. on this yes everything exactly. this is what should be used yeah. it addresses the whole yes. child so Tiffany, do you mind repeating that we want to make sure our streaming folks hear uh, everything uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, no, it just seems like it should be used for every kid, not just kids who are deafblind, visually impaired, in these subsequent categories, rather than it just addresses the whole child. Strength. Yeah, the strength. No, no. I should start singing. Is that a general problem? Yes, it is. Uh, so I, w I would like to come up with something, a lot of examples, as a matter of fact, we do assessment of eight of your kids here, and then we draw up 
the IP within, within the framework that you have to work with. I do that with my friends over in New Jersey because I'm, we are completely free. There is not such a thing as a standard IP. We are free. No one Dutch teacher would do that, but you're doing it. <laughs> no, because they will not obey. They will not obey that because not good for the team. But it's a different culture. I know, I know how things are working here. I've come here for over 30, 40 years. I know how things are working here. So I used to say, yeah, but you know, blah, blah, blah. But now I say, this is the framework. What can we do within that framework? Nobody forbids you to do this kind of assessment. Do you do it then? Nobody says that. No say that. And, and, then, and then, you have, then you have a clear idea about who is that child? What can she learn? And how can she learn? Forget about it and then take the conclusion. She said, okay, that's her strong side. Who, how can we fit that in? I think if you sit around the table with three or four of colleagues, you know, and look to each other children, at least you make a step forward. No? This is Jessica. We had another question from one of our streamers. It's Bethany Miller from our Deaf Blind Project in um, Talladega in EH Gentry. And she asks, will this approach be useful for transition age to adults in any way. Thank you, lady from Taladiga. Um, it is mainly meant for people on the developmental age of two, two, three. But many of our adult transitional students do have this level. And still, if I look to this person, for instance, in a wheelchair, let's look. You can look to his behavioral state, which is very important, how the person accepts transition, new staff members, etc. You could assess that. You could easily assess social behavior. Is that person completely enveloped, you know, in himself or has attention for, for other people when they forget to give a, a, a fork or knife with the, with the uh, evening meal? Does that person request for one? So when I look to, when I look to Alzheimer's people, I have this framework in my mind. You understand that? I have that framework in my mind. It gives me, and that's all it is, it gives me something very concrete to think about, to watch, to observe, to find out when you meet a person with special needs. And as I said, uh, it could be a little bit stronger on motor, and particularly on the sense of smell. But that's a little thing. But I, I think if I ask you, if you look to your clients, to your children, did it cover most of the aspects of a student, a learning, development, developing student? Can you think on anything we left out? Where did it come from? Where did it come from? It comes from a bag of goodies. It comes from different theories. I mentioned in between that I've been working a long time by converting Russia becoming less strict and becoming more westernized by emphasizing uh, emotions, which is, they are emotion, but not in school. So ref reflexology, Vygotsky, looking to the next stage of development, 
is, is very prominent. I think the whole interaction comes from attachment theories, which I'm big favor of because I see that it is a good theory to helping parents and to, to watch when things are going well or going wrong, how the intersubjective relationship is between mother and child. The problem solving is of, and the imitation of course come from Jean Piaget. And when I was trained, Piaget was big, but I did not put his books in my dustbin. They have, do not meet the objective criteria of research, but his observation of his two children were brilliant. So the imitation skill, and now with the mirror neurons, they really come very strong on the table again, the importance of, of a mirror neuron system. The social interaction skills and the eye gaze, and of course is, uh, coming from the field of uh, autism and all the research which, which is going there. So I, during all the years, I picked from these theories the most practical and useful aspects. And together with Kathy Nelson, we put that nicely in the framework and said, okay, we put it on the market. We train people, we have now five or six group of people trained with that, and we wait for the criticism to come. And sometimes they come on motor, and especially I would now do odor, I would do more on imitation, I would do more on resonance, but that's the way you develop. Nothing wrong with that, you know? So that is how the whole thing came together. And I've done a lot of things which I, I came to the conclusion which were not important to, to explore uh, further. So that is how it all came about. It is uh, the most important thing is, I, I think that one of the last words my good friend June Downey said to me, ah, Jan, I love your work, but it is a Jan van Dijk thing. And that makes me really sad because then I would have worked all these years for myself. If I could do it only, then, um, then yeah, it would, would me, make me really sad. But now we have seen that our parents can function within it, our students can learn it. And by now I have given five or six courses all over the world. And, uh, particularly the group in Canada did a magnificent job. You know, I give the courses like this for two days and have live assessment. And then people go to their own clients and they do it and tape it and send it to me and they give them comments and uh, in this way. And people are always, uh, wow, it opens a more clear idea, a more clear perspective on, on the children we, uh, we are working with. And I hope that's here to say. We had another comment um, from Warm Springs, Georgia, Megan Steele. She writes, my only comment question is that this is quite useful for me, even though I work with young adults with disabilities in the vocational rehabilitation arena. I see a lot of clients whose families need hope and who have been counted out. Sometimes communication is the biggest barrier, and this gives me yet another alternative and more confidence. We can help anyone if we are patient and observant. I see this already using the discovery method for customized employment. I'm curious as to how much Dr. Van Dyke believes the skills of the practitioner are instinct instinctual versus learned. I am sure that it is a mixture. Does he have any tips for teaching my staff to be more engaged with our clients so that they can learn more about and from them? You know what? There is only one effective way of training folks like you and myself. 
the least effective way is reading an article. A DVD, how wonderful it can be, it never is exactly the child or the adult you are working with. In service training, the effect is virtually zero. What is the best way of helping each other? You tell me. Training on the job. Training on the job. Doing things together, discussing it together, and again, we have quite a little bit of empirical evidence. The work contact by Marlene and myself, based on my work. In contact, it is about interaction between the teacher and the deaf branch in the child. But quite a group of teachers, over the 20, and quite a group of, of children. And, um, and uh, it shows that observing the teachers, taping it, and sitting back with a group of colleagues, and they don't need Jan van Dijk or Marley Janssen with it, together say, my gosh, you did this, why didn't you do that? God, this is interesting, etc." That exceptions to the rules, you could change and read the publication, you could change fundamentally people's skills by just being there. And teacher can help each other by watching each other's work enormously, to my surprise. And in this training was maximum 10 hours of one, your 10 sessions of one hour and a half. But only very, very few teachers needed this time to understand in what area was the strength and in what area was the weakness. And the good thing is that it had immediate effect on the children's behavior and learning. And that's all about. So appropriate training does affect indirect the performance of the children. And no, you will laugh by it, after six, 12 months, the teachers lost more gradually their new acquired abilities. But the children continue to make progress. Is that not something? So important is good interaction, being sensitive, joining in at the right moment, and, and knowing what you're doing. And, uh, and how we can help each other. It was not, for, and it was also interesting. The years of experience has nothing to do with it. People who had two years of experience could be more effective as people with 20 years of experience because they continue to make 20 years the same mistake and nobody ever told them. We have published, my son and myself, in the American Annals about, about a teacher who, after we did the research, said, I'm going to middle school, I give up, because how, for 20 years, I collected a good salary, and everything I did is missing out on the child. The war of all this time, 4% was effective. Read it. In the, in the journal, 2006 or 2008. So, training together. Your friend is your iPad recordings, and you can help each other. You can help each other to improve significantly in your skills.
And a senior teacher should not say, mm -hmm, I know. No, that was a disappointing thing. And I was glad that they did never chose me. They said, Van Dyke is its thing in itself. We can do it ourselves. So no expensive in service training, being together, taping. But of course, you need a theory, a, a, a framework where to look for. No, without theory, you cannot do anything. Without theory, you do just as the wind blows. Today, it isn't about that. You have to keep the direction based on the theory. When the theory is, gone, is false, okay, the heck with it. Then you choose a new one. But don't zigzag with one way. Now it is iPad, and tomorrow is this, and then it is pegs, and all these things. All these things are available, but make your choice on the basis of assessment. Think always on the architect, he built your house according to plan. You can change halfway. You think, I, no, I want an extra story. Okay, then you sit around the table and discuss whether this is possible. But have a good theory. Have a comprehensive theory, a workable view on these youngsters. And I hope we presented one. And others did, of course, as well. I, I do have another question from the I'm streaming world. Know. Yeah, they're everywhere. Um, this is from Melody Brown. She's an orientation and mobility specialist within the Helen Keller School of Alabama, which is part of AIDB. She asked the Collier Azusa assessment and assessment of deaf blind access to manual language systems or ADAMLS, do this do these assessments work with the child guided strategies? I don't know what it is. I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I follow you as closely as I can. Can you explain a little bit? Do you know what it is? I do not, sir. Does, do, does, do does anybody, anybody in the room know what she's Martha? talking about? Um I, I'm going to, hold, hold on one second, let me give the um, microphone to Martha Vito. Can you come up, please? No, bloody, bloody. I miss. <laughs> I mean, there's more. What, what is it? The Adam LS, the ADMLS. Um, is an assessment of adaptations for manual sign language. All right, all right, all for right. For students with visual impairment. Okay. And it just looks at the different um, effects of visual impairment and how you need to adapt delivery of sign language. All right. So it would be easily fit into a child guided yeah, approach. I, th I think so too. Robbie Blaha, <coughs> Robbie Blaha from Texas developed it. My. Robbie Slayhoff in Texas developed it, and if you want to look at it, it's at the um, NCDB website, um, nationaldb.org, and okay. just... Um, I will. I will. This is not the gospel. It is a framework, and you can, as I said, add more formalness, more form, you know, the, the fine is fine. And there is an uh, adaptation of the violin for uh, deaf people. But all these tests, they tell areas backward, you know, but they don't show the strength of that person. It says only, can that person dress himself more, less, more, etc.? No, he cannot dress himself. Yeah, but what does it mean? Does he not put on his shoes because of his motor system, because of his behavior, you know? So we need to see the individual child. But it's good, let's say, to have the violent and saying, oh my gosh, that dressing, that independency is a problem. Let's use part, to, is it social? Is it motor? Is it uh, not being attentive? What is it? And then I can say, let's assess it. So they are complementary. I don't think that the thing is a complementary thing for your individual child. But I don't think that paper and pencil test and checklist are worth it because 
it pinpoints your thought on where to look further for. And then you need the individual child in action. You need the child to see in action, right? Any psychiatrist judging autism from an inventory, he's on slippery ice. If you have not seen the child and being involved and sitting in the classroom, talking to the parents, the courts, too many mistakes are made. Too many mistakes are made by people who think I know the answer. When somebody knows the answer, give me the address, I will be the next one to knock on the door. I don't have the answers. But all right. So that are people out there, thank you for your question. It's a strange feeling, isn't it? So that people are, are watching, picking you in my nose. So we moved into question and answers. Okay, are there more? No, then from this audience. No, my webmaster always says, you forget one thing, he likes where I always ended with, with what is your take home message? I learned that in this country. <laughs> so now it is my turn. <laughs> so what is your take home message, sir? I think my take home message is that you depart from a <laughs> firm philosophy and framework. <clears throat> and you. then you add to it the pieces or the modalities that you need for the particular child. But you need to understand the, the bigger picture before you worry about the pieces. You cannot do me more pleasure than at the first one to, to underline this. Thank you so much. Sure. Yes. Oh, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My take home message is to continue following the child, observing the child and follow, their lead, follow his or her lead and try to let the child invite me into his or her world. And, and you are encouraged what you have experienced today. Excuse me. Sir. Encouraged to continue. Yes, absolutely. I'm absolutely. encouraged. Yes. Okay. My our intervener. Yes. <laughs> that every child is individual. Excuse me? Every child is individual. That and you sure. can't use some of these assessments that we have for every child. You've got to indiv individualize it. You work with an individual child, don't you? I do. Uh, when you saw gradually that framework growing, yes, did it help you a little bit to pinpoint where your child is and what areas you would like to further to explore? Yes. And we actually, like I said, we just went through this whole eligibility. And when the, the school psychologist came into the school to do her assessment, um, and she had this checklist, and it was everything that our child in our room could not do. There was, it was, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. But we knew what she could do, right? Okay, she can't do it this way, but she can do it. She can do this, this, and this. But by that checklist that they gave us of all that stuff, can she do this? Can she tie her shoe? Can she? No, she can't do that. But she can tell you she wants wheels on the bus. She can tell you when she needs a break. So you have to individualize it. That's my, exactly my story, you know. Yeah. When I came in with my test uh -huh. and checklist, yeah. etc. Right. Yeah. And parents don't take you seriously. Yeah. They say, right. oh my gosh, mm -hmm. that does not give me a lot of courage, mm -hmm. does it? And yeah. as, as we were doing this assessment, this checklist, in our mind we're thinking these parents are going to have to sit there and do this exact same checklist that we're doing. Uh, uh. And they know their child's potential, yeah. but they're having to check no on all this. No, they can't do this. And how heartbreaking that was for them, because it was heartbreaking for us. Perhaps uh, I have sent Jessica the article uh, Kathy and I wrote, it's on my website too, every child has potential. Yeah. Oh, yes. Every child has potential. You have to, if you're doing this in this field, you know, spending the best years of your life. 
you want to produce something, isn't it? Okay. My take home message is play. I don't think I play enough in the classroom. Ah, right. Play. Just play. Yeah. <laughs> not have to get this done, not have to get that done. Play more. One of my DVDs I had, I brought a lot, is the Ten Commands, I think, you know, I'm a religious state, the Ten Commands of Good Play. And I did it with my own grandchildren, mm. building a tower, the Ten Commands of Good Play. And in play is everything. In play is everything. Don't ask me to talk about play, because that takes a lot of day. <laughs> because it is an too much forgotten skill. Mm -hmm. And since we got away, like you, with the old-fashioned kindergarten, where children just came to play, and now they have mm -hmm. to do math, and it has no effect. Because when they are in the second grade, the ones who have been to all this are still at the same level of the ones who come from the rural area. Why don't people force that? They don't listen to research. They say, start early, do you come as good for little C, etc. And not at the end of the day, but halfway the day, they both end up at the same time. All the nice time you've taken away from the kids climbing and, and making all sorts of... There was in, in one of the British magazines, there were 10 things every child should have done in their life, including making a fire, you know, <laughs> stealing apples, making a hut. It, yeah. I passed 100%. <laughs> See, yeah. that other thing. You know, because but I'm lucky, I grew up in a little farm, so the whole world was at, at well, my name. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. We, 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 as I said, we don't know what's going to happen. All this. We don't know what's going to happen. So. I think you're going to have to move to the mic. It's okay. Okay. We go that way. We go that way. That's that side. Oh, you You know how to work with microphones. Just a little bit. <laughs> There's so many takeaways, Dr. Van Dyke. Um, I guess a few would be um, behavior is language. You you always watch the child and rather than try to change their behavior you try to understand what it means and then and then work from there with the child the other the other takeaway for me in watching you work is that no matter what level the child is on you as the teacher seem to find a way to enjoy your interaction with with the kid and then work from there to build something you know, to, to build a, a takeaway for the child during that lesson. The other takeaway is, you know, we all have to follow rules and idea and, and goals and measurable and yada, yada, yada. But you don't seem to allow, um, how do I say this? <laughs> the rules and the regulations to get in the way of doing what's right for the kid. You, you figure out a way to write the goal around what's right for the kid. Yeah. And, and that's a really important takeaway. We all have to follow the rule, but you know what I would tell my AIVB colleagues and, and folks at, you know, back at Helen Keller and here and all around the AIVB family is, yeah, we, we do have to follow the law, but these are our kids and we have to find a way to do what's right for them in spite of the law. And um, that's what I would want, you know, my folks to, you know, to really take away from, from this today and to find a way to enjoy the day. Yeah. You know, it's not always easy and, the, the, you know, our kids aren't always what we would hope would be their best, but that's when they need us the most. And that's when we need to find, find a way to figure out well, what are they saying and how can we help them be just a little bit better or be a little bit happier. Yeah, because otherwise it can be a long day, huh? No doubt about it. No doubt about it. We all know that. Well, we go.
to that direction, why not? Well, we go where the wire goes. <laughs> Okay, my take-home message for the day is that everything that you've presented, I think, can be nutshelled into that our instinctive power of observation is so crucial in assessing our students. And though we have to follow certain federal and state guidelines and follow the law, that we need to, or I need to make sure that I find a way to express my observations of what this child needs in conjunction with what the standards are, what the requirements of law are. And that um, what I may think is instinctive is, is really natural and what's probably best for the student. I'll take your cat. Mm -hmm. I'll take your cat. Yeah. Well, Ma. We just hand the microphone to someone. What about you? I think that I will probably reiterate a lot of things that have already been said. But I think definitely observation, observation. is very important, keeping it simple and not overanalyzing things and making them more complicated than they have to be. And having fun with your students, enjoying that time with them, and not feeling like you have to be in a hurry, even if it's a 30 minute time frame that you have, because there's always the next time to accomplish those goals and, and the objectives that you have for them. And, and really let that, that student guide the way that you're teaching them and that they're learning. Very good, thank you. Yeah, hurry does not fit into this model, does it? Anyone here in the front row? Yeah, the lady in pink or whatever it is. Is it pink? <laughs> but um, I'm totally different than anybody here. I am an early intervention service coordinator. All right. But I also do evaluations with children. And so my biggest takeaway from this is meeting the child on their level, you know, not necessarily coming in and picking the child up and, you know, you got to play with me, but giving them a common ground, you know, like your necklace or something that brings them to you because they're still individuals and we have to respect their boundaries and they don't know us and we don't know them so we have to let them gain that trust with us so that when i send in a service provider i can give a better picture of the child of how to engage that child instead of them having to spend 30 minutes learning this child i can go ahead and give them a heads up on hey wear a nice shiny necklace or bangle bracelets or something like that so that will bring the child to you. So. Okay. All right. So that's it, I suppose. Or do you want me to continue? I, I wanted to make one quick comment, and I think um, everybody can relate to this, regardless of what field you're in, but something that you've taught me, which I have not yet internalized is um, um, being as stress free as possible because I think that my transition over into the child when you're re relating to him or her and so um, that's something that um, Dr. Van Dyke says he's never stressed and I, I really do want to know a secret <laughs> but um, I think that's something that we could all take away from that too is when you come into and, and meet with a child is um, trying to be as stress free as possible so you don't translate your stress over to the, to the child. Don't ask me to talk about stress because it's the most hideous thing in our society, not only for children, but also for a lot of people 
whose life is ruined continuously by stress. Um, you ask me too, what is the protect what are the protective factors for stress? The protective factors for stress are no physical disability. That's number one. Secondly, good cognition, understanding things. Friends, friends. What are the negative sides? When do you run risk for stress? When you have a mental or physical impairment. Secondly, when you are unemployed, big issue, big issue. More, more causes more stress unemployment than losing your spouse. Can you imagine that? Because long time unemployment turns your whole life upside down. Unemployment is a hideous thing. Being alone, having no friends. Yeah. They are the you have protective factors which protect you against stress, and you have factors which make you very vulnerable. But, but, which comes out most strongly in the research and predicts your stress is the relationship with an important figure in your life. Maybe your parents, maybe your brother, maybe your sister, etc. Interpersonal relationship. Feeling. What do you then you feel? What do you feel when you click with a person? It is, it is a chemical thing. It is a chemical thing when a mother clicks with her child. There is a hormone, oxycotin, which is released. And it is like a stimulating drug. It feels good. It feels good to have that drug that or that hormone working in your brain. Tomorrow you want to have that again. Okay. It can only stay in human beings about a couple years, but then it comes back, and you all hopefully have experienced it, when you fall in love. When you fall in love, that first year, month, also a maximum two years, it seems to give <coughs> that extra thing to your system. You won't always be with that person. And when that person comes there, that makes you happy. So. That is now, well, in mother-child interaction, talking about measure, we can measure whether there is really a good attachment. Because then that hormone is excreted. And you can buy that hormone in the chemist. Yeah. You smell and you become excited. So there is a bio, biological thing on which true trust and true interaction and fine life is built. But basically, basically, it is a chemical, a chemical process. It's a chemical process. 
in human beings, it stays for a while, but not in swans. You know, the swans always turn around each other. For them, they excrete oxycetine the whole life. So become a swan. It means, it means that this chemical circuit in our system is the basis for all human interaction. In my old, old, old world work, I called it it. And I never know what it was, but now I know what it is. It is that click, that smile, that enormous feeling of mother-child, and sometimes a little bit less in father, which laid the foundation for a healthy emotional life. Right. That's the biggest gift you can have in your life. And that's the biggest protector against stress. And how do we know? <clears throat> how do we know? We know that in stressful situations, and we know that from your army people, when you call, you are sent to Pakistan, you know, Mali, or wherever you have to go, that's a stressful requirement. Now, at that moment, are you going to seek comfort and support of your parents? That's great. You say, no, I'm grown up, I'm a United States Army soldier, I don't need them. You are very vulnerable because you need them. Or the other way around, when that person has to make small decision, keep calling up. I said calling because that's research, how many times they called and what happens to them afterwards. Okay? So there is a regulation of stress based upon attachment. Based upon attachment. Even your spelling degree, your spelling, uh, whatever, your points, marks, is dependent on attachment. I, uh, that's strange. You know what a spelling, you know, to do. Yes. It has the biggest impact on human life. I came to a long time to this conclusion, but now I read and follow the literature and see the enormous problems we have in mental health. Mental health is my second issue. I'm be pulled in it because there are so few clinical psychologists or psychiatrists who know these kids and who know where to look for, like you, person with the checklist. We don't need them. And all the time, when there's a mental health problem, aggression, depression, psychosis, anxiety disorder, very strong anxiety disorder in this population, right? I know the answer. But don't, don't, don't tell anybody. But I know. I know what to look for. I always ask, is your mom still alive? How was it? I was there. There you go. That is most important thing there is. Forget about everything in life. Career, we want a healthy mental life. Enjoyable life. And not always anxiety. Do I do good? Shall I do this? I have to call my friend. I, I'm afraid. I'm sleepless. I'm... Oh, I have everything. 
Go always do the basics. Go always do the basics. The basic is this. And you see it. You see it in two minutes. Whether that enjoyment of each other is. A big technique is trained situation where uh, between the child, between 18 months and three years, together with the mother, and you're there, that's why you are the stranger, and you say to the mother, will you be, say goodbye to your child for three minutes? And then, the camera, you observe. And sometimes you have to call back the child because it's getting really turn up and bangs against the door. So then the mother comes back. And then you see already there, you see three types of behavior. Two years old, there's the one child, type A, and goes and plays on. No relationship already. Type B, the child who climbs on the mother's lap, as we've seen there, embraces and continues, has a secure base. And then child C goes up to the mother and bites her. They kiss and slap children. They want to be picked up and then they bite in your ear. They all have already a lost status at and is very predictive for the rest of your life. That is the main mental health issue. It has nothing to do with um, intelligent, handicapped or not. One thing has to do is face deformity. When the mother has difficulty in finding the face of the child because the face is deformed. That, that's why I'm so looking for the eye contact because eye contact is the most important parameter to judge this. Can you make eye contact with the child? But when you have a deformed face, it is hard. <coughs> and mothers who have a bad story of attachment themselves don't have it. They can, you play, and the child wants to have your attention. A mother comes, and when there is a good attachment, the mother uh, uh, applauds and says, that's very nice. Bad attachment, mothers correct and say, you could put that in that way, and this in that way, oh, that's nice, but, and what happens, the child destroys his own building. You all see that. I'll see that. I go to kinder and I see that. I go to deaf kid. In two minutes, I say, that one, that one, that one. Let them play and I can see everything. The ones who stand aside and all of a sudden run into another child and chase off. If we want to prevent criminals, criminality, if we want to prevent that our psychiatric hospitals are overfull and that so many are running on the street, homeless people. Here we are. That is the starting point. <coughs> Nothing else. That's, it's not an employment, yes, for stress. But the basic thing in mental health is early child bonding. And it works, as I said, in the academics, in your career, in the number of divorces people have. If they say, I am sorry to say, I'm divorced three times, I know you have an attachment problem, 100% sure, exceptions to the rule. Sometimes after all seeing all this mental unbalanced people, I see them from a distance. How they walk, how they talk, what they want to show me, when I talk about the mother, in five minutes they are crying, you know, 
talk about a sister who has a glorious career and they were left out because they were dead or whatsoever. If you ask, if I had put this up five years ago, now a little bit more, I would say lost case. No, you can, you can restore it. You can, once you know you have an attachment problem, if possible, if possible, I see that in the Alzheimer's homes where I work as a volunteer. I bring in pictures of the mother, if I find it. And I say, and the mother loves you. No, 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 your mother loves you. All mothers love their children. All mothers love their children. Do you think so? Yes, she has loved you, but she was 